Welcome to J4's English Training, I'm Jennifer, and in this one hour English lesson, you're going to test your listening skills of fast-paced native English speakers that you hear on TV, movies, YouTube, and everywhere outside of the classroom. If you struggle to understand native speakers, then this is the lesson for you. First in this lesson, you're going to listen to the YouTuber Stefan James, and he's going to talk about the daily routines of very successful people. Now, as he does this, you're going to complete listening exercises, and you're going to learn a lot of vocabulary and grammar as you understand what he says. So let's do that right now. So in this video, I'm gonna share with you guys. So in this video, I'm gonna share with you guys. What do you notice this first word is? So, it's that word filler we've already talked about. So, in this video, I'm, I'm gonna. What do we have here? I'm. Of course, it's a contraction of I am, good. Repeat, I'm, I'm gonna. And what's this? A reduction of going to. Very good, I'm gonna. I'm gonna share with you guys. And here, of course, we have guys, which I taught you last video, that it's gender neutral. So here, obviously, he's talking to an audience of both men and women, but he's still using guys to mean both. So in this video, I'm gonna share with you guys, so in this video, I'm gonna share with you guys some of the morning rituals of the most successful, the most famous people in the world today and throughout history. Some of the morning rituals of the most successful, the most famous people in the world today and throughout history. Now, let's just look at this. Now, in the video, he says this very quickly, and it's because we're reducing the words. So, of commonly between two words, of is reduced to a. Uh. Sama, a. Uh. But here, I'm making this sound very quick as well. I'm saying some, some. And I'm connecting it with a. Uh. So this sounds like together, sama, sama. Repeat, sama. And then I also say the as one. Some of the, some of the. Okay, repeat, some of the. Very good. Some of the some of the some of the morning rituals of the most successful, the most famous people in the world today and throughout history. Here's the first person he talks about, and this is Tony Robbins. Now remember that we use the present simple to describe facts about individuals, their personal information. So here, his job is a life coach. So how would you put this in a sentence in the present simple? You could say, Tony Robbins is, the verb to be in the present simple, is a life coach, because we need that article before our professions. So repeat, Tony Robbins is a life coach. Very good. Okay, how could you put this information in a sentence? Again, you could say Tony Robbins is from California as a complete sentence. Repeat, Tony Robbins is from California. Very good. And his age. Now put this in a complete sentence. Very good. Again, Tony Robbins is 57. Now notice, of course, we're using is because I'm referring to Tony Robbins in the third person, singular, which is he. So I need he is for all of these sentences. Okay, now let's find out about his daily routine. And he starts off every single morning doing some form of a morning ritual. He starts off every single morning doing. Now here, where is the verb in the present simple? Very good starts and of course we have this s because it's he he starts now what does this mean starts off notice we have off this is a phrasal verb to start off so we need the verb and the preposition in order for it to make sense so he starts off 
start soft. Okay, repeat, start soft. Very good. And this just means begin. So I could say he begins, add that S. He begins, this is in the infinitive. He begins every single morning or he starts off every single morning. And what do you notice with this verb? It's in an ing, a continuous form. This is because of the sentence structure. He starts off every single morning doing. Okay, so here we have the expression to start off in the infinitive with to, something. So here the something is every single morning. That's the something. By, and then your verb in ing. Now here we have doing. Now notice, notice that in this sentence, there's no by. By should be right here. Now, why is this? Is he being grammatically incorrect? Well, to be honest, yes, he is. But because by is such a small word, a preposition, English speakers often leave them out because we don't need them to understand the meaning. However, grammatically, we need to include this by. So I'll give you some examples. I always start off my meetings by introducing everyone. Okay, so what's the verb in the present simple? Start off. And of course, I don't have that S because the subject is I. Okay, what's an adverb in the sentence? Always is the adverb, very good. I always start off something. The something is my meetings. That's the something. So here I have my by, and then I have my verb in ing, by introducing, so verb here, by introducing everyone. Another example, I never start off my day by drinking coffee. Okay, so again, the verb in the present simple, start off. What's the adverb here? Exactly, never, I never start off and what's the something in this sentence? Very good. My day is the something. I never, never start off my day by, and then my verb in ing, by drinking coffee. Okay, very good. And he starts off every single morning doing some form of a morning ritual. And he starts off every single morning doing some form of a morning ritual. Hey, of course you know who this is, President Barack Obama. Now, let's find out some information about him. Job, of course, politician. Now, put this in a complete sentence for me, using the verb to be. Barack Obama is, and then what do I need? Is a politician. Very good. And Barack Obama is from Hawaii. Excellent. And this one? Good. Barack Obama is 56. Very good. And he starts off working out 45 minutes first thing in the morning. He starts off working out 45 minutes first thing in the morning. Okay, now, again, he used the same expression. Starts off. But what are we missing here? Very good, I need by. He starts off by working out. So notice he did it twice in a row. He's leaving it out. Okay, and then I have another phrasal verb, to work out, which I taught you means to exercise, exercising. But of course we need that verb in the ing form because that's how this expression goes. To start off by, verb in ing by working out 45 minutes first thing in the morning so here we have a time expression first thing and this just means early in my day so first thing in the morning so let's say i woke up at six o'clock a.m well maybe something i do first thing in the morning could be at 6.30, for example, 
or maybe even seven o'clock. So it's just early in my day. It doesn't have to be literally the first thing I do. Okay, and we can say first thing in the afternoon or in the evening. It doesn't always have to be in the morning. So for example, I always take my dog for a walk first thing in the evening. So the evening, let's say the evening starts around five o'clock. Well, maybe I take my dog for a walk at six o'clock. So again, it doesn't have to be right at 5.01. It just means early in the evening. So in this expression here, where is the verb in the present simple? Good, take my dog. Okay, and is there an adverb in this sentence? Yeah, always, I always take my dog. And he starts off working out 45 minutes first thing in the morning. And he starts off working out 45 minutes first thing in the morning. Um, he also avoids coffee instead of, uh, and instead drinks water, orange juice, or green tea. Um, he also avoids coffee and instead drinks water, orange juice, or green tea. So notice how he begins his sentence with um, which is just a word filler. And this is a word filler we want to avoid as much as possible. Um, he also avoids. So what's the verb in the present simple? Very good, avoids. So this is a negative expression to mean to not want to do something. He also avoids coffee. Okay, but notice here that there's no verb. This is just a noun. He doesn't add a verb, which is fine, but if we wanted to add a verb, we need to use a verb in ing form. So for example, he always avoids drinking coffee. Now sometimes in English we have one verb and then the next verb is followed by ing. And really it just depends on the verb that comes before. So avoid is one of those verbs that afterwards we need an ing. But notice avoid is still in the present simple, so I need this s he avoids. And what's the adverb? Always. Very good. He always avoids drinking coffee. But we don't need it. We can do this structure here. He also avoids coffee. And if I wanted, I could repeat a subject and say, and he instead, but I don't need to, like in this sentence, he instead so instead is a word that we use to decide between options. So I have one option is coffee and the other option is water. Well, there's also orange juice or green tea. So I can give a sentence and say, I drink tea instead of coffee. So notice here we have instead of, but your sentence is in the present simple because this is talking about our daily routine. I drink tea instead of coffee. Okay, or I could say, I'll have coffee instead. So we can use this as a standalone word at the end of a sentence. If someone offers you two choices, you can say, someone might ask, would you like tea? And you can say, no, I'll have coffee instead. Okay, very good. Um, he also avoids coffee instead of, uh, and instead drinks water, orange juice, or green tea. Um, he also avoids coffee instead of, uh, and instead drinks water, orange juice, or green tea. Do you know who this is? This is Mark Zuckerberg. Now, he is the founder of Facebook. So give this to me in a complete sentence. Good, Mark Zuckerberg is the founder of Facebook, is, I need to say, the founder of Facebook. Very good. Can you give me a complete sentence here? Good. Mark Zuckerberg is 30. Very good. And remember that we also use the present simple for our likes and dislikes, because these are considered information about us. 
So I would put this in the present simple as well. So can you give me a complete sentence? Mark Zuckerberg likes, with an S because it's he, he likes computers. So this right here is a complete sentence. He likes computers. Mark Zuckerberg likes computers. Very good. He always wears the same thing every morning, the same shirt. He always wears the same thing every morning, the same shirt. Okay, let's start at the beginning here. He always. Notice that there's a slight Y. We use this Y sound to connect two vowels. So I have a vowel here and a vowel here. So to make this a smooth sound, I can say he always, he always, he always. But it's so quick and so subtle that you don't notice it very much. But you can use this to connect vowels. He always, repeat, he always, he always. And what is the verb in the present simple? Excellent, wears, good. He always wears the same thing every morning, the same shirt, okay. Now notice here we're using always, which means, of course, every day. But do you think Mark Zuckerberg wears the exact same shirt every single day? Probably not. However, English speakers often use always even if it's not seven days a week. So I can say, I always wear sweaters in the winter, but really it's more of a usually or often because always technically is seven days a week. Now, I don't wear sweaters every single day, but I'll commonly just say always, if I mean usually or often. He always wears the same thing every morning, the same shirt. He always wears the same thing every morning, the same shirt. Because... Do you know who this is? His name is Howard Schultz. Okay, let's find out his job. Okay, can you put this in a complete sentence? Okay, good. So we need, of course, the verb to be. Howard Schultz is. Now I need an article. We say the CEO of. So remember with Mark Zuckerberg, it was the founder of Facebook. Here it's the CEO of Starbucks. Do you know what a CEO is? It's a chief executive officer. It's the highest position within a company. Okay, good. And can you put this in a complete sentence? You can say, he is from New York City. And as a contraction, remember, I'm going to say he's. He's from New York City. Good. And of course, what does he like? Give this to me in a complete sentence. Very good. He likes coffee and probably he likes Starbucks coffee. <laughs> okay, let's find out his daily routine. Uh, it says, I get up at 4.30 in the morning. I get up at 4.30 in the morning. Okay, so what do you notice here, first of all? Get up, this is of course a phrasal verb with a verb and a preposition. Okay, and notice the sound. Get up, I get up, get up. Now, why is this happening? Because in American English, when we have a T between two vowels, we turn it into a D. I get up, I get up. Repeat, I get up. Very good. I get up, and now we have an at with a specific time, at 4.30 in the morning. There are many different ways to express time in English because we use a 12 hour clock. We have a.m. and p.m. 4.30 in the morning, which is also 4.30 a.m. Or we can just say 4.30. And same if it was p.m., we could say 7 o'clock p.m. 
7 in the evening, 7 at night, or just 7. So many different ways to express time. Uh, it says, I get up at 4.30 in the morning. Uh, it says, I get up at 4.30 in the morning, 4.30, and I walk my three dogs and I work out. I walk my three dogs and I work out. Okay, so where's the first verb here? I walk. Walk my three dogs. Now we can also say, take my three dogs for a walk. These are two different sentence structures, but they mean exactly the same thing. So one we're saying, I walk. The other is, I take. Okay, I walk my three dogs and I work out. But here he's not saying and, he's saying n. I walk my three dogs and I work out, and I work out. This is a way to reduce this in natural spoken English, and I work out. Good, and notice here, work out. But because of linking, I'm going to transfer this K sound onto this vowel, and it's gonna sound like I work out. Out. I work out. Repeat, I work out. Very good. And I walk my three dogs and I work out. And I walk my three dogs and I work out. So he Amazing job. Now let's continue on and you're going to listen to an interview with Jennifer Lopez, J-Lo. And you're going to test your listening skills and learn a lot of natural expressions, phrasal verbs, and vocabulary that you can add to your daily speech. So let's do that now. All right, our next keyword. The interviewer is going to ask J-Lo another question and I want you to fill in the rest of the question. I'll play it three times. How are you picking what projects that you want to take on? How are you picking what projects that you want to take on? How are you picking what projects that you want to take on? How are you picking what projects that you want to take on? So here, our keyword is to take something on, and this is a separable phrasal verb. And it simply means to start working on a new task or project, but in the sense of you accepted it, you accepted a new task or project. So here, he's asking her, how are you picking what projects that you want to start or accept? So let's say you're in this staff meeting and you're discussing a new project. And one of your colleagues could say, who has time to take this on? So this would be whatever the new project is, right? So who has time to accept this new project, to start working on this new project? Who has time to take this on? Remember, it's separable, so the pronoun has to come in between. Or another example, Marcos, can you take on the graphic design part of this project? So here, you have an entire project, but somebody could just take on a specific part, right? And in this case, it's the graphic design part. Or maybe you could say, I really regret taking this new project on. Oh, okay. So here we see our verb as separated, take and then our noun in the middle, this new project on, okay? Now, regret, regret is a gerund verb. So notice, I really regret taking this new project on. That's why we have the ing here, because regret is a gerund verb. Another example, I'm under a lot of pressure right now. I took on too many clients. So here in the past, right? I took on too many new clients. I, I've always been this person who takes on a lot and, and because I, I love so many things. Okay, so let's do our next listening exercise. So here you need to fill in three blanks, okay? So pause this, take some time to read it, and I'll play it three times. You know, not taking on something that's going to take up seven months and yield this much. Right. You know, not taking on something that's going to take up seven months and yield this much. Right. You know, not taking on something that's going to take up seven months and yield this much. Right. Not, did you hear this? It was our keyword. Not taking on something that's going to take up seven months and 
yield this much. Yield, you might not be familiar with this. It simply means to produce or result in. I don't think you'll use it too much, so don't worry about it. So our next keyword is to take up something. Now this is a separable phrasal verb, but I have a asterisk here because we're going to talk about the structure, okay? And this has a simple meaning. It means simply to use a specific amount, but we use this in the specific context of time, resources, or space. Now think of resources quite broadly because within this we have many different things, right? We have money, we have our effort, we have our human resources, our manpower, and other things as well. So let's take a look at some examples. You could say, this new software takes up so much space. Remember, space was in the context of how we can use it. Now, you can think of this really as just use. This new software uses so much space. Another example, this new client I took on is taking up all of my time. So you're actually going to see these two side by side quite a lot. So don't get confused with these prepositions here. This new client I took on, so I agreed to work with, I accepted them as a new client, is taking up, is using all of my time. Remember, time was one of the things we can take up. Can I store a few things at your place? I promise they won't take up a lot of space. Or how about this bathroom reno is taking up the majority of my savings. So I want you to notice that we modify this a lot. So here, so much, all of, what else? A lot of, the majority of. So we frequently modify this with talking about how much or how little time, effort, resources, money, something takes up. Okay, let's take a look at another example where we see this in a pronoun form. So let's say somebody says, you don't have any room on your hard drive? And then you can reply back and say, nope, this program took it all up, okay? So the it is what? Room, room space on your hard drive, right? This program took it up, and all is one of the ways we modify it. So here, take up, but then our pronoun comes between it. This is the only acceptable form, okay? And so this follows the separable phrasal verb form. But on the last slide, all of our examples with nouns we actually put the noun after the phrasal verb. So you can go back and look at all those examples. The noun always came after. Now, although this is technically a separable phrasal verb, I don't hear people put the noun in between. And it sounds awkward to me. I couldn't find any hits on Google where people were using it with the noun in between. So I recommend that you follow this structure for the noun form. So you could say, this project took up my whole summer. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it here, okay? But for the pronoun form, it has to come in between. So it follows the separable phrasal verb form for the pronoun. It has to come. There's this only one that's correct. So for example, this project took it up. So let's, now, let's say the context of summer was obvious. This project took it up. You know, not taking on something that's going to take up seven months and yield this much. Right. Way to go, you're doing awesome. Now we're going to review a clip from the TV show Friends and you're going to test your listening skills and learn a lot of vocabulary and grammar. So let's do that now. Hey everybody, uh, I'd like you to meet Janine. She's, she's gonna be my new roommate. Hi. Hi. And she's gonna live with me. Is 
nice to meet you, uh, Janine Lacroix. Janine Lacroix. I didn't know that. Well, what a pretty last name. <laughs> so, uh, where, where are you from? Australia. I just moved here a couple of weeks ago. From the land down under? Yeah. I didn't know that either. <laughs> so, uh, wh uh, what do you do? I'm a dancer. You're a dancer? <laughs> she, she's a dancer. Well, I think I'll go and unpack. Oh, wait, wait. Hey everybody, hey everybody. This is a casual greeting that we use in informal situations when you're meeting friends at let's say a cafe or the movies or even at a casual work meeting as well. And notice the pronunciation here, everybody. So it's not body like the spelling suggests, everybody. This is why it's very important to not use the spelling to learn pronunciation in English. They're very different. So repeat, everybody, everybody. And look at the syllable stress here, everybody. So we're stressing the first syllable, everybody. Hey everybody, repeat, hey everybody. Another casual greeting we can use is, hey everyone. Hey everyone, repeat, hey everyone. Or a very common greeting, hey guys, hey guys. Now notice here, guys is not only for men. It's gender neutral and we use it for both a group of men and women or even just a group of women. We can say, hey guys, if you're greeting a group of only women. And I do this myself a lot with my girlfriends. I'll greet them and say, hey guys, even though it's only ladies. So now choose one of these three greetings and use them on me. So, great. Hey everybody, hey everybody. Uh, I'd like you to meet Janine. I'd like you to meet Janine. I'd like you to meet Janine. This is how we introduce someone in English. And notice here the contraction, I'd. This is a contraction of I would. I would. I'd. Repeat, I'd. English speakers use contractions 95% of the time in both formal and informal situations. I encourage you to start using them now. So we have, I'd like you, like you. Notice the linking of these sounds and how they blend together. And it actually sounds like, like you. This is because we take the last sound of a word and we transfer it on to the beginning of the next word. Like you, I'd like you. And then we have the preposition to. Because this is a preposition and is not an important word in the sentence, we reduce the sound. N is going to sound like t. I'd like you to. I'd like you to. Repeat. I'd like you to. I'd like you to meet Janine. So this is how we introduce someone in English. I'd like you to meet, but we can add more information. I can say, I'd like you to meet my friend, or my wife, my brother, my boss, and then we say their name. I'd like you to meet my friend Janine. Okay, now you try introducing your friend to me. Great job. Uh, I'd like you to meet Janine. Uh, I'd like you to meet Janine. She's, she's going to be my new roommate. <laughs> she's going to be my new roommate. She's going to be my new roommate. Here we have a contraction, she's. Do you know what this contraction is? She is, she is. So is, of course, is the verb to be. And as a contraction, she's. Repeat, she's. Next we have gonna. 
which is a reduction. A reduction is a natural change that happens in spoken English where we take the sounds of two words and we make them one word. So this is a reduction of the words going to. And we say gonna. But notice again the pronunciation. It's not with an O sound. It's with a U, G, gonna. Repeat, gonna. She's gonna be, repeat, she's gonna be. She's gonna be my new roommate. Now remember, reductions are for spoken English only. In natural English conversations, friends will use reductions in let's say text messages or informal meetings, but it's something you want to avoid in writing and just use them for oral, for spoken English. She's gonna be my new roommate. She's, she's gonna be my new roommate. She's, she's gonna be my new roommate. Hi. Hi. Yeah, she's gonna live with me. She's gonna live with me. So we have the same, a contraction, she is, and then the reduction of going to gonna. She's gonna live with me. Repeat, she's gonna. She's gonna live with me. And here Joey gives you the definition of roommate. It's someone that lives with you. It's someone that lives in the same home as you. So, do you have a roommate? Hi. Hi. Yeah, she's gonna live with me. Hi. Hi. Yeah, she's gonna live with me. It's nice to meet you, Janine Lacroix. Janine Lacroix. It's nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you. This is the expression we use after we're introduced to someone in both formal and informal situations. So notice here we have a contraction again. It is, so we still have the verb to be, but this time it's with the subject it. And this is it's. Repeat, it's. And we have the same reduction, it's nice to meet you. But here, Monica actually says, it's nice to meet you. So Monica doesn't reduce this. There's no reason why, it's just her choice. So you can say, it's nice to meet you, it's nice to meet you. We can also say, it's great to meet you, it's great to meet you. Or, it's a pleasure to meet you. It's a pleasure to meet you. These are alternatives you can use. So I'm going to introduce myself and you choose one of these expressions to use. So, hi, my name's Jennifer. It's nice to meet you, Jennifer. That's what you could say. Next, Monica says, Janine. Notice how she uses both her body language and the lingering sound, Janine, how she draws out that sound to indicate she wants more information. Janine. This is a common way to ask for someone's last name without saying, what's your last name? So this is how we can ask for someone's last name. And notice that Janine replies and she knows exactly what Monica wants. And she says, Le Croix, Le Croix, Janine Le Croix. So if I wanted to know your last name, I would say, oh, it's nice to meet you, Mohammed, Julie, Stacy. And I would hold out the N sound and then you would know I want to know your last name. It's nice to meet you, uh, Janine Lacroix. Janine Lacroix. It's nice to meet you, uh, Janine Lacroix. Janine Lacroix. So, uh, where, where are you from? So, uh, where are you from? No one is here the word so. What is this? Well, it's a word filler, which means it has no meaning. It's what we use to introduce that we're about to talk. 
It signals that everyone should pay attention to me because I'm about to say something. We commonly use it at the beginning of sentences or to transition from one subject to the next. But then he uses uh, uh. This is another word filler that has no meaning and it should be reduced as much as possible. Uh, um, uh. These are not what we want to hear in our speech. So, uh, where are you from? Notice here, where are you is reduced. Where are ya? Where are ya? So what I'm doing is I'm taking just the R sound and I'm reducing this to ya, which is a very common reduction. And I'm just combining these as one word. Where are ya? Where are ya? Repeat. Where are ya? Where are ya? So, uh, where are you from? This is how someone would ask you in natural spoken English. Where are you from? Okay, now you tell me. So, where are you from? Great. And now you ask me. So, uh, where, where are you from? So, uh, where, where are you from? Australia. I just moved here a couple of weeks ago. Australia. I just moved here a couple of weeks ago. So notice this word, I just. This again is a word filler. It has no meaning. It is used commonly in spoken English. It means only. I only moved here. I just moved here. But in reality, we could delete it from the sentence and there would be no change in meaning. I just moved here a couple of weeks ago. Let's talk about this. Couple of weeks ago. So when we have of between two nouns, we reduce it to a. Couple of weeks ago. Couple of weeks ago. I would not say couple of weeks ago. So I reduce the sound, but then I also have to connect all these words together. So it sounds like couple of weeks. Repeat, couple of weeks. I just moved here a couple of weeks ago. Great. And what verb tense are we using in this sentence? It's of course the past simple because I'm talking about a completed past action. So here, the verb moved, it's a regular ED, simple past. And it's a completed past action with a start and a finish. Australia, I just moved here a couple of weeks ago. Australia, I just moved here a couple of weeks ago. So, uh, what, uh, what do you do? So, uh, so, uh, what do you do? Here, we're using the same word fillers. So and ah. Uh. And he actually repeats himself twice probably because he's thinking about what he's going to say next. And then notice how these sounds blend together. What do ya? What do ya? So what's happening here? Well, similar to before, I'm reducing you to ya. What do ya? And then I'm dropping this sound and I'm connecting them together. What do ya? What do ya? What do you do? This is how someone would ask you in natural spoken English. What do you do? Okay, so you tell me. So, what do you do? So, uh, what, uh, what do you do? So, uh, what, uh, what do you do? I'm a dancer. You're a dancer? <laughs> I'm a dancer. I'm a dancer. Here we have a contraction. I am. I'm. And... Then we have an article. So this is very important. When we're talking about our profession, we always need this article, a or an. Here, because we have it starting with a consonant, it's a. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a dancer. Now, we could also say, I'm a teacher. Again, we're starting with a consonant, so I need a. But what if I said, I'm an electrician. So here I'm starting with a vowel, so I need an. I'm an electrician. But notice I'm using contractions the whole time. Or I can say I'm a server. 
Now, what is a server? A server is the gender neutral term for a waiter or waitress. So in English, waiter and waitress are now considered outdated terms. We don't really use them. Instead, we use the gender neutral term server for both a man and a woman. So I'm a server. Okay, now you tell me, what do you do? Great, did you make sure you used the article? I'm a dancer. You're a dancer? I'm a dancer. You're a dancer? Well, I think I'll go and unpack. Well, I think I'll go and unpack. So here we have a transition word, well. It's a word filler, but we use it to change subjects. So we call this a transition word, just like so. So, well, I think I'll go and unpack. It's Janine's way of getting everyone's attention and letting them know she's about to say something. But remember, we could just delete this word and the sentence would not change in meaning. I think I'll go and unpack. So what's this here? It's a contraction of I will, I'll, repeat, I'll. But in natural spoken English, the unstressed pronunciation is I'll. I think I'll, I think I'll go. Because we say it so quickly, it loses some of its pronunciation. I think I'll go. I think I'll go and unpack. And of course, I will is the future simple. And here she's using the future simple because she's talking about a spontaneous action. Spontaneous just means that the action was not planned. So this is when we can use the future simple. I think I'll go and unpack. Now notice here, I think I'll go and unpack. But in natural spoken English, this is going to sound like going. I think I'll go and unpack. Going, go and unpack. We often reduce the word and to n, just a n sound. I think I'll go and I think I'll go and unpack. And of course, unpack means to take your clothes or your personal items out of a suitcase or a box. Now remember, J Janine just moved, so she needs to unpack, get settled in to her new home. Well, I think I'll go and unpack. <laughs> I'll go and unpack. Hey everybody, uh, I'd like you to meet Janine. She's, she's gonna be my new roommate. Hi. Hi. And she's gonna live with me. It's nice to meet you, uh, Janine Lacroix. Janine Lacroix. I didn't know that. Well, what a pretty last name. So, uh, where, where are you from? Australia. I just moved here a couple of weeks ago. From the land down under? Yeah. I didn't know that either. So, uh, wh uh, what do you do? I'm a dancer. You're a dancer? <laughs> she, she's a dancer. Well, I think I'll go and unpack. Oh, <laughs> Amazing job. I have one more listening exercise for you and this time I am going to first say the sentence for you and then you're going to listen to that exact sentence on the TV show Friends. So let's do that now. I'm going to say an expression three times and I want you to write down exactly what you hear and then afterwards I'll explain the expression to you. Okay, here we go. Gotcha. 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 Hmm, are you surprised that all I said was one word? Can you even imagine what this could mean? Well, this is a really fun expression and one that you'll hear all the time on TV, in movies, and in 
everyday conversations. So let me give you a sentence to explain what this means. Let's say your boss comes into your office and says, you need to finish that report by five o'clock tonight. As a reply, you can say, gotcha. Okay, so this gotcha is used as a reply and you're telling your boss that you understand. So when you say gotcha, you're telling your boss, I understand that I need to finish the report by five o'clock. So that's what your boss would make a request. And if you want to say, I understand, I see, or it could also mean no problem, you're acknowledging the request and you're implying that you will be able to meet the request as well because you're saying gotcha, which means no problem in a lot of ways. I explained this expression to the students in my online school and it was so great to hear their reactions because I had a lot of students already using it and it was really fun for me to hear my students reply to my questions with gotcha by telling me they understand and it made them sound so natural and so fluent. So here's a clip from my online school to show you exactly what this expression means. And this clip uses the popular TV show Friends to show one of the characters using this expression. I'll explain the pronunciation and the expression in more detail in the clip. I wanted to be with you. I missed you so much. Hey, hey, uh, who'd you miss the most? Monica. Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. And then Joey says, gotcha, gotcha. This is a good one and you should know it and also use it. It's a fun expression. Okay, so it actually means got you, got you. But this means I understand. So Joey's not saying it, but it's really I gotcha, but I wouldn't pronounce that. I just wouldn't say it either. I would just use the expression gotcha, which means I got you. And this just means I understand. For example, your boss could say, we need to finish the project tonight. And if you want to tell your boss that you understand, you understand that you need to finish the project tonight, you can reply and just say, gotcha, gotcha. This is a totally acceptable reply. It is not slang, it's not offensive, and I would use it with my boss, and you're welcome to use it as well. Gotcha. It's a fun expression. Okay, let's talk about the pronunciation. So here we have a T and a Y sound. So a T and a Y together. This is pronounced as a CH, CH. That's why you hear gotcha, CHA, gotcha, gotcha. And that's why we actually spell it like this. But this gotcha is not a word in a dictionary. It's got you, but it's pronounced as gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So let's look at another example. We have a T and a Y. So here I have a T and a Y side by side. So I can say, I need to meet you. Meet you. So I'm adding that ch. I need to meet you as soon as possible. Meet you. This is something that you, now that I've told you about it, you're going to hear it all the time. You're going to notice this ch sound. And you'll also notice the j sound as well. Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> 
amazing job with this lesson. You've improved your listening skills. You've learned a lot of vocabulary and natural expressions, and you've improved your grammar as well. Awesome job. If you found this video helpful, please hit the like button, share it with your friends, and of course, subscribe. And before you go, make sure you head on over to my website. You can click the link right here and you can get your free speaking guide. In this guide, I share six tips on how to speak English fluently and confidently. And until next time, happy studying.